I met Stephen when I was 16 years old at a concert. Um, I had just be recently met a girl who invited me to go to parties um, at concerts, and it sounded real exciting to me at 16 years old. I thought I didn't have to think too hard about it. I knew I wanted to go along and see if I could meet Stephen. Um, I went along with her and I met him, and um, we began a relationship that lasted about three years. I was underage, and he became my legal guardian. I lived with him in Boston, and I traveled with him on tour. And at first, I didn't think that it would be a long-term relationship. I just knew that I cared a great deal for him. I thought he was about the best thing that had ever happened to me. I, I idolized him. And um, after we had been together for some months, he asked me if I was open to the idea of having a family, a child. And I was on the birth control pill at the time, but he said he wanted a family and he wondered if I wanted a child. I said, yes, I did. I cared so much for him and I loved children. So um, I told him, absolutely, I wanted a child. We were in a hotel and he threw my birth control pills off the balcony. And um, within about a year, I became pregnant. I remember coming to him and telling him I was really excited. I wanted my baby so much and I thought, I couldn't wait to tell him, and he also seemed happy when I first told him that I was pregnant. And um, within a few months, he asked me to marry him. I was surprised and so happy. I thought my life couldn't get better. I was going to marry a man that I loved, who I idolized, and I was going to have his baby and we were going to start a family. And he took me to New Hampshire, where we had been before. His parents had a farm there that they had like a little resort. And um, we told his parents about our decision to get married, that I was expecting a baby. And their reaction was, um, not surprisingly, they expressed concern. I was very young and immature. and. They were not as supportive as I had hoped. His mother was very supportive, but his father had grave reservations and was not shy about telling us what they were. Stephen asked his grandmother if he could give me her wedding ring as, to get married with, and she declined. She felt that if we divorced, the ring would leave the family. and. Uh, it was just a train wreck after that. On the way home, we argued just bitterly. I was so, I felt so vulnerable. I was expecting his baby, and I was his ward. I really had very little say in what happened, but it seemed that he had a change of heart. He didn't want to get married any longer, and I was very angry, and I was not shy about telling him that I felt that he had really betrayed my trust. We returned to Boston, and where we had our apartment, and we were just kind of in limbo. I didn't really know how it was all going to work out. I just thought, well, well, I'll have the baby, and we'll just live together. He left on tour, and he decided to, to leave me there at the apartment because I was about five months pregnant. I don't know for sure how far along I was because I had not seen a doctor. But um, he left me in the apartment while he went on tour. I was... Um, I had no education. I dropped out of high school. I didn't have a driver's license. I couldn't go anywhere. I had no money of my own, and I had had no prenatal care. So I was in a, in a difficult position. He would call in the evening to check on me, but um, after about two weeks, the food in the apartment was running low, and I remember telling him, I need to go grocery shopping. And he said, well, I'll send someone over tomorrow. He was gonna send Ray over who was a former band member and had helped with the band when they traveled. He said, I'll send Ray over. He'll take you grocery shopping tomorrow. So I was so excited because I had been cooped up in that apartment for two weeks and I was going to get to get out of the house. I, I sat there by the window just waiting for Ray to come. And he arrived. I let him in. 
And I don't remember what happened after that, but I woke up in a fire. Ray was gone, and the apartment was on fire. There was smoke everywhere. I could not see anything but smoke. Um, I knew that I had to get out of there quickly because I couldn't breathe. I stood up and I tripped on the table. I fell to the floor, and the smoke was less dense on the floor, and I remembered um, some commercials that I'd seen on TV, public service announcements about how to survive a fire, and said, stay down on the floor because you can breathe better. I made my way to the front door, and it was locked. There were three locks on that door. All three of them were locked, and the bar lock was jammed. And I didn't, I just knew I had to immediately find another exit. So I made my way to the back stairway that led down into the kitchen area where there was another outside uh, exit. But when I got to the stairs, there were flames and smoke coming up the stairs. And when I reached out to grab the railing, it was so hot that I burned my hand on it. And I knew I was trapped. There was no way out of that house, that apartment. But I remembered in those commercials it said, if you're trapped in a fire, find a fireplace. And there was a clean, empty fireplace in our bedroom. I crawled into the fireplace. The flue was open. I, I lay there. I could, on the very bottom of the floor, there was air. And I could see smoke just churning and billowing up the fireplace flue. And I was about to fall unconscious. I knew that I was going to die. And that's where the firemen found me. It was in that fireplace. They pulled me out and I woke up in the hospital. When I woke up in the hospital, um, I had, had had smoke inhalation and the doctors had thought I wouldn't survive because they had checked my oxygen levels and they were very low. They said if I lived I would have brain damage. But I was fine. I woke up. I was able to answer their questions. And um, I was in the hospital for several days. And Stephen came to me, and he said that I needed to have an abortion. That was where I was when he introduced the idea of my abortion. And I was just shocked. I couldn't imagine even thinking about having an abortion. I had thought I was going to get married and have a baby and start a family. And I was also, I remember telling him, how could you even ask me to consider this? I'm almost five months pregnant and I've just barely survived a fire. This is not fair. I shouldn't be asked to make such a, such a serious decision in, in a situation like this. And his words to me were that I had to have the abortion right now or the doctors wouldn't do it because I was so far along. He wanted me to have that abortion before I left the hospital. I just kept saying no until he placed the decision between him and the baby that I was going to have to go home uh, if, if I decided to keep my baby. I just couldn't imagine my life without him and I was so young. I. I just really gave in at that point, and that was where the, the worst ordeal began. Because I was so far along, I underwent a late-term abortion. They didn't explain it to me, they just wheeled me into a room. I was naked. <sighs> Stephen was there, and the doctor stood beside me, outside of my view, and he said, hold very still, or you could be killed or hurt. And I remember I just froze. I was terrified. I didn't understand what did he mean. I was about to ask him when he stabbed my stomach with a needle. And I just gasped in shock. And then they injected saline into my uterus to kill my baby. And that was a partial, that was a a saline abortion. So they took me into another room. I had to labor so that my baby's dead body could be delivered or born. I was in labor for many hours and Stephen sat beside me snorting cocaine on the table beside my bed. At one point he offered me cocaine. 
And I remember just turning away from him and just so sad and grieved inside at what was happening. I was in disbelief. I, I was in shock. I couldn't believe that this was happening. <sighs> After many hours, the baby uh, was delivered, and the nurse immediately took my baby away, and I did not see what happened. Later, when we were in New Hampshire, Stephen told me that my baby was born alive, and that it was a little boy. I have read about I, these late-term abortions since then, a saline abortion, and I've I've read that it's not an uncommon thing that a baby would be born alive after a saline abortion, and that when the baby's born alive, at that time, they would kill the baby with by either snipping the back of its neck or other methods, strangling it. I don't know how they killed my baby, but Stephen knows. He saw what happened, and he told me about it. When, when he told me that, he was telling me that he was terrified, that he had a sense of dread and re regret over what he had done. He felt that God would punish him. And I was just in disbelief. I couldn't believe that it could be legal for them to just kill a baby that had survived an abortion. And I began to cry. Stephen tried to comfort me by telling me that I couldn't go back and do anything differently now, that the baby had died already so that you know, I, should, I shouldn't try to think about it. And he tried to comfort me by saying that we had done the right thing. And I remember being filled with anger because I knew that this was not the right thing to have done. It was wrong. And my baby was dead. I felt like I had been robbed of this precious life, this child, and I had personally been injured as well, and that I was made to cooperate with it by being put in the position of choosing between the baby or Stephen. I was so angry with myself for agreeing to it. I wished I could go back and change my decision, and I couldn't. It was too late. But our relationship was never the same from the, those days forward. It was about a year before I returned home, but we could hardly look at one another without thinking about that horrific abortion. I would encourage any woman who has had an abortion, anyone who has participated in an abortion, or if someone is in a relationship with someone who has had an abortion, it would be very healing uh, if you could attend a retreat like Rachel's Vineyard.